uh, first of all, good morning and afternoon, everybody. Um, for the one that don't know me, um, Francesco Michele, I support the Global Protection Cluster on Analysis. And I will be very brief, and then uh, I'll be looking forward for Dania and Katrin to guide us with this session. Um, I wanted just to frame a bit the thematic section of today. Um, and first of all, thank you all of you for participating. Uh, this is like the seventh thematic session that we are doing in the framework of an yearly learning plan that we are doing as a sector in order to advance our understanding on how to contribute better to protection analysis. Um, many of you participated in past sessions, but the idea of this thematic session is just to give us a bit of zoom in on specific aspects of protection analysis that can contribute to our collective learning and then advance uh, together and improve basically our overall approach to protection analysis. Um, what uh, I'm particularly interested of today is as many of you know, but uh, I just want to, to, to refresh for everybody, as Protection Cluster, as HPC and Global AUR, we're going to publish actually this week the renewed guidance on protection analysis, which consists on a joint up approach that has been agreed by the Global Protection Cluster and the Global AUR, and a set of tools. And there are two aspects that as a background that are fundamental to link the session of today. One of the major aspects that we try to work on this year is to basically rationalize the type of data and information we need for protection analysis. Uh, I think that we all recognize that on protection, uh, we can't do protection analysis just with primary data collection, but we have to be better in using secondary data analysis, understand which information is needed, and oftentimes that information and data is already available. So it's uh, for us in protection analysis to try to understand how to join up efforts, to join up existing information and data in a way that makes sense to understand in continuous way um, basically what we want to understand. The second aspect is that we clarify better at the level of the sector uh, now do we use analysis for? So we use it to primarily identify and priority protection risks. And then this year we have been doing uh, in the approach a better linkage with between the resulting humanitarian need for those protection risks. So as a background to all of this, uh, in the last uh, nine months, we've been working hand in hand with the global AURs, but also with uh, certain actors uh, from the information analysis working group, uh, REACH, uh, the DTM, on doing a full harmonization of data and information, meaning uh, but much more clarity on which data and information can be used for protection analysis and specifically looking at the outputs that we, we want to produce collectively uh, in, in cluster at country level. So having said that, uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to this session. Um, the objective will be explained by Downey and Katrin, but one of the efforts we want to try to do better this year ahead of the next HNO uh, season, let's call it like this, is how we can well identify type of information that is existing among all of us and use it better for collective protection analysis. So having said that, uh, thanking again everybody uh, for, for joining and over to you, Downey and Katrin. My last comment, if there is anyone who would like to ask in French or Spanish, please, please feel to do it and we will try to support you in the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. So um, we have three main objectives today. We're very ambitious with two hours. The well, first one is that we hope at the end of these two hours, we all be uh, more familiar with what to consider when we uh, try to do safe, ethical and effective data collection how to evaluate appropriate methods and sources for specific data so that these are safe, ethical and appropriate and effective, sorry. And then explaining why some questions should not be included in a data collection uh, exercise uh, and then provide alternatives. So these are the main three um, objectives. And for some of you, uh, this safe, ethical and effective sounds familiar, I hope. Uh, in fact, um, what we uh, will go through today is uh, what we have defined as, a, as a, an enterprise's data responsibility. Um, we will talk about that a little bit, but then we'll talk about in practice, how do we make our data collection safer, more ethical, more effective. And we'll try to do for the most of the second part, a quiz, a game to, um, part to so that everybody is participating and thinking about how do we do this in practice. So we hope to keep it 
interesting and interactive. So be ready to answer questions. Uh, we do finish uh, the session with um, best practices, resources that you have at your disposal and contact details if you need to. Having said that, um, I wanted to, um, to um, show you this slide because I think it's, it's visually effective to remember what data responsibility is, safe, ethical and effective data management. Um, and a note, today we will very much focus on data collection, but data responsibility looks at all the different steps of the cycle of data, data and analysis cycle. So keep that in mind for uh, today's uh, session. Um, I, I would like then maybe, uh, Catherine, to hand over to you to introduce to us a little bit the guidance and the uh, working group. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Tonya, and uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Very good to be with you today. So the notion, the concept of data responsibility, as this session is also going to be about, comes out of a collective effort over a number of years where we were in what we now today, and we can go to the next slide down here, please. Uh, we call today the, it's a global data responsibility working group, the DRWG. We were initially established uh, upon request from the Interagency Standing Committee as a subgroup in, back in 2020 and commissioned or requested to develop an operational guidance on exactly how to manage data in humanitarian action in a safe, ethical and effective manner. So how to make basically manage data in a responsible manner. So initially established as a subgroup under the YESC, uh, under the results group one of the Interagency Standing Committee, we have later transformed into what we today call the Data Responsibility Working Group. And our main focus and what we have been doing all along is developing this YESC, Operational Guidance on Data Responsibility in Humanitarian Action. And we are already now at this point in time have the second edition. So first edition was in 21. And now most more recently last year, we uh, had the second edition of this operational guidance endorsed uh, by the YESC Secretariat. Uh, and that is the one we have in place today. This is a wonderful uh, operational guidance because the benefit of this is the authority it has being endorsed by the YESC uh, Interagency Standing Committee, the uh, coverage it has in terms of uh, applying across all sectors, so also beyond the protection sector, and now in this context we are talking in the global protection cluster and protection colleagues, but this guidance indeed applies across all sectors in humanitarian action. It applies um, across sectors or clusters for that matter. It applies basically system-wide. So it has these three levels of applying to you as an individual agency organization, applying uh, across sectors, clusters, and applying system-wide. So the role of the Data Responsibility Working Group is basically as a custodian uh, for this, specifically for this YASC operational guidance that you'll hear much more about today in the session uh, and its its principles and actions and templates and everything that you can find in there. And more overall, the role of the Data Responsibility Working Group is indeed to come together as the various uh, diverse organizations and agencies we are coming together to advance, together jointly advance data responsibility across humanitarian action. So that is our uptake, that is our mandate, and specifically being the, the custodian of this um, operational guidance, which will be continued to be further developed and, and, and updated as we move forward. And maybe we go to the next slide where you can see, indeed, we are a growing group, a global group uh, in the Data Responsibility Working Group. It's co-chaired by, at this point in time, four different organizations, agencies. So namely the OCHA, the Center for Humanitarian Data, IOM, and uh, represented by Daunia here, UNHR, 
and the DSC Danish Refugee Council, where I myself, and I realized maybe I didn't introduce myself, but I'm from the Danish Refugee Council. I'm the global uh, head of our global protection unit. Uh, so I'm representing DSC as a co-chair in, in this group. And then you have a beautiful suite, I think, of, of uh, operational organizations and agencies that all work with data and all have contributions to make in this data responsibility working group. And as you can see, it's a combination of UN and NGOs and other types of organizations. What is important here in terms of the relevance of being a member and contributing to the data responsibility working group is that this is a group for operational humanitarian actors, so to speak. So for actors who are concretely working with data uh, in humanitarian action, so to speak. So these are the members at this point in time. And then if we go to my last uh, slide here, to become a member, importantly, if you wish to your organization uh, agency to become a member uh, of the data responsibility working group, this is what to do. You can see the email, who to contact the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data. Uh, you can find much more about the group uh, and also, of course, the, the guidance. And I know Daniel will continue to re refer back to the guidance and its principles and elements. Um, what is important in terms of uh, managing expectations of what it means to be a part of the and a member of the DRWG, you are serving uh, as a, the focal point for your organization. So it's expected that you bring forward to the meetings, you know, information and, and contributions that are representative of your organization. You are expected, of course, to also, as much as you can take away, hopefully, uh, great benefits of being a member, but also equally, of course, uh, contributing to the work of the DRWG. And then also, because we all come with uh, many other sort of efforts that we are also working on uh, uh, simultaneously, an expectation and a hope also that each of us are also contributing and making sure to connect the dots, so to speak, with the other data-related initiatives, the efforts we are working on that are of relevance to data responsibility and advancing data responsibility in humanitarian action. So that's the DRWG and that's the custodian and uh, with a very clear role of advancing uh, data responsibility across humanitarian action uh, and with the specific responsibility to continue to, to disseminate, to uh, encourage and support the uptake, the adaptation, adoption of the, the YASC operational guidance on data responsibility and also to revise and update it as we move forward. Thanks, Daunia. I'll leave it here and uh, hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, we did say you were from DRC, but uh, I didn't spell out. It's Danish Refugee Council. Sorry for that. Um, I really like this particular visual in the guide, in the operational guidance, because it solves a lot of confusion I usually have in my head. Um, so one of the main uh, uh, main issues is def defining what data responsibility is, but also redefining it vis-a-vis -vis data protection, which is a, a different thing from data for protection, but data protection. So data protection um, really deals with personal data, as you see in the slide and on the, on the visual. Uh, well, data responsibility encompasses data protection, but it's more than that. So it deals with personal and non-personal data. And I think we need to remember that when we talk about everything that we will talk about today and in our daily work with, uh, with data and analysis. So if you are interested uh, and if you think like I do that this visual is very clear, do have a look. It's in the operational guidance on data responsibility. Uh, but then what is it? We've been talking for about 15 minutes about data responsibility. What does it mean? Uh, is really the safe, I'm reading the, the definition, the safe, ethical and effective management. So safe, ethical and effective, like in the slide in the beginning of the session. Of personal and non-personal data, as we said, it's not only about personal data, but also non-personal data for operational response in accordance with the frameworks. For personal, uh, for personal, uh, for personal data protection. Sorry, for personal data protection. What does safe mean? 
Safe means that data management activities are um, ensure the security of data at all times, respect and uphold human rights and the other legal obligation and do not cause harm. So that's what safe means. Nothing new, I guess. You can all recognize that this is very much what we are always trying to do with we, within our work. And we also do that, or we should be doing that also when we work with data. Ethical means that data management activities are aligned with the established frameworks and standards of humanitarian ethics and data ethics. And we'll see more in details what these uh, really mean when it comes to uh, data uh, responsibility. And then effective means that really data management activities are well coordinated and achieve the purpose or the various purposes for which they were carried out. Um, so we we have safe, effect, ethical and effective data management as a definition for data responsibility. And we also have clarified what these three things really mean um, in the guide. Again, all of this is something you'll find in the operational guidance. Now, my question to you, um, my first question to you is, what role can the protection cluster play in this, in data responsibility and in implementing data responsibility in the daily work, in, in your daily work or in your country um, coordination and IM work? And I know it's really difficult to start answering a question, the first person, would uh will will get a specific a special a special praise the first person who is able to break the ice and speak out um about what do you think that you as protection cluster or gbv or or child protection or other aors what can you do when it comes to data responsibility in your daily work how do you help the uh safe ethical and effective management of data and I see there is somebody writing in the chat. Oh, Francesco says you can use the chat to answer as well. Any volunteer? The first person who answers will also have the easiest time. Oh, thank you, Cassandra. Ensure we have system in place to prevent data leak. Yeah, excellent. Anything else? Oh. Maybe data management protocols, um, also well established for the protection cluster partners. Thank you, Kimberly. Standard operating procedures, yes. Data sharing agreements that are put in place from the beginning of the data management activity, not at the end. Um, Cassandra, you train staff on data protection, excellent. Dorian. Identify which tools and methods are most suitable for what typology of questions. I love this. We're going to talk about this for most of our session today. Thank you. Said, uh, protect against unauthorized access. Again, thank you very much. Very important. So you have been looking at different times, different steps of the data management process. You were talking about data um, collection, as Dorian is. You're talking about um, uh, data storage, uh, both for Said and Cassandra. And Kimberly was talking about, I think, data sharing. And if if I'm, uh, but also maybe other steps. So you, you do have different actions and activities that you can do as uh, in your daily work when you deal with data. Um, and next question then, if we don't have any more people, and thank you very much, Kassan, for being the first one and the bravest of all, together with Dorian, Said, and Kimberly. Um, you have probably been uh, discussing in Nairobi in the last uh, retreat of the protection cluster what Francesco calls the Harmonized Data and Information Data Bank, um, the tool that was presented to you, which is really um, linking um, the, uh, protection risks and information, data information, and then the methods and the, and the tools to use. If you can think and focus on that tool for a moment, can you maybe suggest how that work and how you using that tool can support data responsibility? And if Francesco wants to intervene and remind people what the tool looks like, 
and when you presented it, that might help. You want me to share? I will not share the screen, um, but for everybody, the tool, I can share the screen if you need it. But uh, yeah, the tool basically looks at uh, um, clarifying what is critical information need and what is an expanded set of information need for each protection risk that we analyze. So try to make that difference in understanding exactly what we need to understand and for what. And then uh, it uh, it has a set of elements that organizes a bit uh, the data information across the methods, because sometimes it's not about the data and the question itself, but it's about the method we use for that question. Maybe I'll stop there, but I hope, for, I hope that my colleagues from the cluster will come in on this. Does that help trigger your memory about it? Maybe, thumbs up, thumbs down. I don't know what I talk, what you're talking about down here. That's also acceptable. Dorian, thank you. Common understanding of how data feeds into analytical framework. Exactly, fantastic. What's the end goal? And we'll see how this links, for example, to the one of the principles, the defined purpose. Perfect. There is also maybe somebody else who wants to propose how this harmonized data and information data bank helps implement data responsibility in practice. Francesco said something also about methods and sources. Clear guidance, thanks Kimberly. Oh, thanks Francesco, put the link to the current iteration. Okay, yeah. And I don't know what Kimberly meant, but it's clear guidance in also when it comes to linking the right method to the right to the type of information it can provide. And in that yes, way, totally. we, exactly. Thank you. Want to say anything more? Did you notice anything? Kim? No, no, Kimberly? you can continue. Okay. Yeah. Super. So there are two aspects to it. This the first one is what uh, Dorian was saying how data feeds into your analysis. And the second thing is Kimberly was talking about, which is how does uh, each type of information um, best, how is that best collected? And why is that important is because we talked about safe, ethical and effective. And all these three issues have to do with the way we collect certain information. So I'm gonna move to, um, I'm gonna continue. But feel free to continue putting your comments and uh, questions in the chat. So um, this is really a little bit of what we just said. So you have the 15 protection risks in the harmonization tool. You have the protection analytical framework uh, pillars. You have the three dimension of protection needs. And then you have the questions that are related to each one of uh, these protection risks, needs and pillars. And then you also have the uh, suggested phrasing for questions that are individual level or a household level and so on and so forth. So let's talk a little bit now about safe data collection. What does it mean? We said safe, ethical and effective. We start with safe because it, safety comes first, as you see on the slide. So uh, what does it mean to have safe data collection? And again, we're talking about mostly about collection here, uh, but when we collect data, we also need to look a little bit further than collection. Uh, this little uh, decision tree, a flowchart, is trying to really summarize what we would like to have when we collect data or before we collect data. We would like to look at each question that we put in a questionnaire, for example, and try to understand if um, we may be exposing people to additional risk in with that question or with the data that comes out of that question, with the way we uh, in the method that we're using, whether it, during the collection time, the collection stage, of course, but also we need to look at during the storing of that data, during the sharing of that data and the analysis of that information. And one really crucial thing to remember is that we can put a number of people and groups at risk. We can definitely put the people uh, who are asking the questions at risk, our enumerators, data collectors, interviewers, whatever you want to call them. But we can also put the people who are answering the questions or ask, this, or ask these questions, so the respondents. 
We can put their communities at risk, we can put their families at risk, and we can put the organization at risk as well. So we do need to consider a long time frame that goes from collection of the data to storage, to analysis, and to the sharing of data. But also we need to look at the different groups and individuals that we may be putting at risk. The data collectors, the respondents, their communities and families, and the organizations themselves. If then we can uh, implement some measures to minimize this risk, we should do that and we should identify roles and responsibilities and then implement them. If not, we do need to go back to the drawing board and uh, redesign that question. And that's why it's so important that we do this uh, in advance before we do, we design and finalize the tool for data collection and we look further uh, what happens after so that we can prevent that harm to be done uh, by designing the question differently. Now, this is a little activity that I'd like to do with you because otherwise I get tired of hearing my own voice. And I'd like you to respond either on the chat, but uh, I'm very happy to hear your voice on. So you, you know, unmute yourself if you want to answer that. I'm going to um, read three little scenarios brief. And I'd like you to reflect on each one of them. I'll start the, the first one and then I'll stop and ask you some questions. Um, I'd like you to reflect on the scenario and tell me who you think we're putting at risk within that situation and at which step of the data management process, whether we put people at risk when we collect the data, when we store the data, when we analyze the data, when we share the data, and who to who are we putting at risk? The enumerators, the respondents, the displaced community and uh, host community in some cases, and the organizations themselves, or others, if you, if you think there are other people we're putting at risk with that behavior. Is it clear so far? Can I have some thumbs up if it's clear or thumbs down if it's not clear? Is there even the possibility to put thumbs down in on, on Teams? I don't know. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good. I'll start with the first scenario. Let's say we are in the process of interviewing individuals on the move going through a border. We ask questions about the violence they may have experienced. Some of the survivors of violent attacks relieve their violent experience without any possibility to receive help at the moment or in the near future. We also ask questions about trafficking to people that are moving through a border area. And some of these people are indeed in the process of being trafficked. In addition, their traffickers are with them. The traffickers may become suspicious, seeing that some people are approached by our enumerators, but others are not approached by our enumerators because we clearly cannot approach everybody, right? Um, so they become suspicious and uh, start wondering why we approach those specific individuals and not others. Maybe the person, maybe these persons have said anything or they've asked for help in some way. The traffickers decide at that point that the people we interview should be punished to give an example to others not to talk. So this is, a, I hope, not a real scenario, but a scenario that uh, we, we really need to avoid. Um, in this scenario, who would you say we're exposing to harm? And at which step of the data management process? Are we putting people at risk during data collection, during data storage, during data analysis, or during data sharing? And who are we putting at risk? During data collection, Carmen, thank you. That's very true. Ahdi is even more specific. Respondents during data collection. I think Sardar says, ooh, many, many answers I can't, find, I can't follow. Even during data collection, exactly. Enumerators and respondents. Thank you, Angeliki. Um, Stine, data collection, enumerators and respondents. Okay. Respondents, as Cassandra put at risk during data collection and after, as well as other people trafficked, not interviewed. That's a very good point. We're putting other people uh, at risk as well. Enumerate responder organization during data collection. Thank you, Dorian. Um, Angeliki, can I ask you to explain why you also included respondents? Sorry, enumerators. Enumerators. 
Hi, everyone, and thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, yes, uh, because the numerators might be targeted by traffickers or um, yeah. by other elements who are crossing the borders and we don't know their background. Yeah. Uh, but yes, they might so be are... directly attacked or they might be attacked in the future or their, um, their work might uh, uh, be, yes, uh, affected Hindered, by the affected. safety yeah. environment. But there is a real risk of their personal safety being at risk, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, you weren't the only one, but I, uh, you were the first one, so I wanted to hear from you. Thank you very much, Angeliki. And indeed, uh, you'll see all your respondents, but I think it's very true. It's also numerators that are put at risk. Good. I'll go with the second scenario. While working in a country invaded by Western army, we hired a number of local staff for our humanitarian activities. They work keeping a very low profile and keep their link with us a secret for most people. This is because the other warring party considers as traitors anybody who works with Western aid organizations. As we cross a checkpoint, our laptops get taken. The personal details of our local colleagues are on the laptops. The files are not encrypted, on, and one of the laptops has no password, is not password protected. This will lead to threats and violence towards our local colleagues who may be forced to flee their homes. This is unfortunately not an, an imaginary scenario. Um, who are we putting at risk in that scenario and during which phase of the data management process? Enumerators because of data storage or staff in that case, yes, because of data storage, yes. Anybody else? Enumerators and respondents, okay. If if our staff was actually collecting data, we would probably, and this data were uh, personal data, we would have probably put at risk also the people who responded and staff. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's getting easier, isn't it? Oh, interesting. Uh, somebody says organization. Um, Ahdi, do you want to explain why? Uh, no, community. Sorry, Ahdi, you said you said community. Do you want to explain why? What you're thinking? Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, actually, I think like it's the organization and others like, uh, uh, for example, communities, because if staff is belonging to a certain community in the field, uh -huh. uh, they might be threatened also as well. Um, this kind of belonging to which community, who's like like uh, taking sides uh, on those kind of things. Excellent, yeah, thank you very much. I didn't think of that, yeah. And other people are seeing organizations, enumerators and respondents. Very good, yeah. Excellent, third scenario and last scenario for, for, for this exercise. We have conducted, and yes, sorry, just to uh, I to re repeat what you already have written in the, in the chat, both of you, uh, and also Sarah, it's it's definitely before because of data storage or because of the problems with data storage. Thank you. Example number three, scenario number three. We have conducted a, rap a rapid assessment in a country to identify the main sectors of, de of need in each location. Very common thing that people do. We ask people what type of uh, support they need, and we also included protection among the possible answer, but the respondents did not understand what we meant by protection. So nobody answered that their community was facing protection uh, issues, even if displacement, family separation, gender-based violence and evictions were rampant. Our analysis did not consider this and simply listed the responses of each community. Donors saw that protection activities were not amongst the top need and decided to reduce funding for protection, GBV and child protection and give it to other sectors. In this example, who do you think we put at harm, we exposed to harm and during which uh, part of the data management cycle? That's a little bit more complex as an example, right? So we ask what your need is, Communities did not say it's protection, and we reported the data with protection being very low, and uh, so the funding went to other sectors because uh, donors didn't see that we were really identifying a need for that. 
OK, so Sardar says data analysis. We put the community at risk. Thank you. Stine, data collection, data analysis, displaced communities. Very interesting, yes. Uh, Cassandra, uh, the communities because of data collection and the analysis, even before data collection with the data design, exactly, with the designing of the question, we were designing that question, talking about protection, using a word that we think we understand, but a lot of other people don't. At least not the same way we understand it. And somebody really agrees with you, uh, Cassand. Um, and then act the organization and displaced community during data collection. Yes, organization, because we have reduced funding, exactly. And displaced community. Uh, Alice, Alice, why displaced and host community? Because of the risk that you were mentioning uh, that the people face, the protection risk that they face, like they have evictions and separation, etc. So we have host communities, we have displaced community dif facing different types of protection risks. So we put them all at risk because we are not identifying them because we are not during the data collection phase. We're not asking the right questions to have the right data. So we are not analyzing it correctly. And so we also put them at risk. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Carmen, I think you're saying the same thing. Yes, we're not being able to adapt our language and understand community dynamics when collecting and, anal and analyzing afterwards. So thank you very much, all of you. I think you all identified the right issue. You have data analysis only identified by red, red dots, but it's definitely an issue also at data, at data collection uh, phase. Good. Um, Question again, what role can the cluster, the protection cluster play when it comes to conducting what we just did, which is a, really a do no harm analysis of uh, the data activities? What can you as protection, GBV, child protection, and all the other AORs, what, what is your role? What can you play? How can you uh, support the rest of the humanitarian community in a country? Because you have a specific talent and skill that not everybody has. Okay. Dorian says overview of intersectoral assessment and advice. Dorian, do you want to tell me more about it? Tell us more about it. Yes. Uh, hi, Dorian. Nice to see you again after many years. Um, so basically, um, at the moment, and this is just a very practical experience in the clusterized operations where um, many intersectorial needs assessments um, or uh, uh, rapid needs assessments and various types of things are kind of organized and handed, handled by uh, OCHA. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of these things are not really being given to um, to uh, supervision from the protection point of view. Um, maybe it is the case here where I work, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a recurring thing, but um, uh, in the same way that we have a role in centrality protection, we have a role in many other things, we could potentially position ourselves to have a role uh, in ensuring that some of the principles that you just mentioned uh, are before things go to the field are being, uh, are being, are being, are being uh, taken seriously and implemented. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Dorian. And I see that Alicia agrees with you. Uh, Alicia also added a few, uh, one, two, three, very specific. Thank you very much, Alicia. Training organizations on data responsibility. Yes. Yes, please. Support the analysis of collected data collectively. And that's a really important thing. I think you are saying similar to what, uh, similarly to what Dorian was saying, it is a role of the protection cluster because of your expertise to support others in making sure the, um, uh, the, the, I'm oh, no, sorry, maybe it's a different, different, you're talking about uh, supporting the analysis so that, that it is well done. So you support the analysis of the collected data and analyze the protection data landscape. Thank you. And then you agree with Dorian. Uh, Carmen says capacity building on data collection and protection analysis for partners and setting a common framework and common tools. So looking at common tools so that you can use your specific protection uh, lenses to look at whether or not the data uh, collection tools are or exercise is, is potentially harmful or not. Agdi says advocate and raise awareness for principles 
for protection information management. Absolutely. Thank you. And Dorian agrees with also with the analysis side, and it, it's a really, really important point. Thank you. Thank you all of you for this. Um, so, as a, I mean, maybe it's, this slide is not needed, but I like to, to keep this in mind. If something doesn't work, if a question is wrong, if a question is potentially harmful, we change the question. I, as the, the initial slide was saying, safety comes first. So there is no justification uh, to collect data that is actually harmful for people. Um, and we need to change the, the question. And there are so many ways to get to the same type of information. That's what we need to start becoming more familiar with. If we know that this is dangerous, we find another way to get the data we need so that we can do our response, uh, make our response decisions properly. Thank you. I'll take a breath. We've looked at safe data collection. Now let's have a look at ethical data collection. They're not completely separate, but let's have a look at what the operational guidance on data responsibility identifies as the 12 principles. And if you remember in the definition, they were talking about a framework for ethic, uh, ethical um, for ethical principles, ethical framework for data and for protection. And if you look at these 12 principles, they really are very, very familiar to all of us. Whether you are the protection expert, whether some of us are more information management experts, we do know uh, that we usually do our work according to this these principles. So we try at least very hard. We have accountability, we have confidentiality, coordination and collaboration. We have data security. We have defined purpose, necessity and proportionality. We have fairness and legitimacy. We have a human rights based approach, people centered and inclusive, personal data protection, data quality, retention and destruction, transparency. I'm not going to go through all of them because we don't have the time, but there are very, very short and very clear definition of what these things mean in the beginning of the uh, operational guidance that I really invite you to go and have a look at. Um, and maybe Francesco or Catherine can put uh, the guide itself in the um, in the chat if if they are able to do it through the teams or the link to the guidance because there is a website. But I want to look at some of these principles in practice, um, assuming that you're very familiar with some of them already. Um, I wanted to ask you if you had any idea of how to implement in practice the, pe the people centered and inclusive principle. So what does it mean in practice to make sure that our data activities are people centered and inclusive? Um, maybe something that you uh, can think about, but also probably something you already do. And Francesco has put the data responsibility guidance in the link. Catherine as well, thank you. <laughs> um, so what does it mean? How do you in practice ensure that your data activities are in line with this principle, are people centered or and are inclusive? Is there anything that you already probably do or that you would like to do that uh, we, can, we can use as an example for the others? Sardar, thank you. Design the data collection with the people we work for, fantastic, to make it people-centered and inclusive. Excellent. It's really difficult, Sardar. And if people have uh, experiences on that and they can share links on how we design data activities um, with the communities and the people we are supposed to serve, really, we really appreciate it. Um, so put that link in, those links in the chat. Ahdi talks about consent, absolutely, informed consent. Sardar says also analyze it jointly with a workshop, with the people, I assume, with the people we are we're, we're working for. Thank you very much. Anybody else with some more um, ideas? Okay. I have a couple of uh, things here. Um, Designed the data activity to address the needs of affected community and not our curiosity 
or a donor's curiosity. I know this seems a little bit banal, but it's not always that we follow that. So let's remember that we have a responsibility to uphold this principle. Um, they're loose. Ensure it's inclusive by considering gender, disability, using the Washington group set. Interesting, yes. And Angeliki, I think you are also saying similar thing. Include marginalized and less privileged groups. Very interesting. And um, and I would like to think you to think about this when we go through our questions. When we do data collection, by choosing a specific method, we might be taking away the voice of marginalized groups. So if we go and talk to key informant interviews, that might be the people that are more in a position of uh, power in the community. We are taking away the voice of the female headed households, the ethnic minorities, the uh, unaccompanied children, and so on and so forth. So it's really important to keep in mind, especially for protection, GBV, child protection colleagues, that the choice of method is going to have a huge impact on which voice you hear and therefore which response you can de design. Thank you for so much, both Ber uh, Berlus uh, and Angeliki, for that. Ensure that the voice and needs of all groups are included. For example, what I said before, complement head of households and key informants data with focus group discussions with vulnerable groups and to understand their needs, resources, and priorities. Um, it's important to understand the community and its power dynamics so we don't so we make sure to involve those who don't usually have a voice and that's extremely uh, it's really important and we need to work hard on that because it's not always that we do that understanding who these vulnerable groups are because vulnerability is not always the same right it's not always the same groups who are the most vulnerable depending on to what and where they are use the appropriate method of data collection like interviewing men and women separately boys and girls separately and that those are good examples thank you i'm going to go with the next principle which i think catherine knows this is my favorite principle of all of them i don't know why but i think it's great it talks about define purpose necessity and proportionality there it needs to be a specifically <laughs> desired, defined purpose for anything we ask and any data we collect. Catherine, did you want to say something? Please come in. You're muted. Just to say it's my favorite too. It's so super important. It's defining the whole forward process. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, then we can also hear from you if you have a favorite principle that is different from ours. You can put it in the chat. So define purpose, necessity, and proportionality. Ahdi says, how do we implement that in practice in our data activities? Starting from use and information needs, not from question. Ahdi, thank you so much for saying that. Yes, Francesco is also in agreement. Very good. Um, anybody else? Necessity and proportionality. Anybody? Who, to, who can give me some ideas about proportionality? What, what would that look like in practice? Dorian, it's the principle uh, that needs most buy-in explaining to protection officers and colleagues. So true. It is one of the most difficult things to, 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 to communicate. Uh, so it's, it's really good that our colleagues on the call are identifying that as one of the... Um, the, the important pr principles and they're telling us how to do it. So I think I have more or less the same thing Ahdi is saying, collect only the data that fit your purpose, nothing more. Each data point should help make decisions that benefit the affected communities, not other types of decisions. Do not include questions without having a clear plan on how to use it in practice for the defined purpose. It seems the same thing, but I just wanted to highlight from an information management point of view, um, we might think that we know how we are going to use the results of a question. In 89% of the cases, I have been wrong. Maybe you are better than me, but uh, there is a risk that we're wrong. So we want to write it down before we start going out and collecting data. We want to write down the purpose, how we are going to use that information for that purpose, and then the information we need. So that's a really good, uh, good practice so that we don't collect data that are not in line with defined purpose and they're not proportional. So we, you know, we might, 
we might collect data that are really uh, not proportional to the purpose that we, we want to achieve. The last one of these principles I'd like to test with you in practice, the human rights based approach. I could not skip that one. Um, I have a suggestion, but I want to hear more from you, please. How do we implement human rights based approach in practice in our data activities? My suggestion is something we worked really hard in IOM to do. Um, when we go out as uh, data collectors, we often receive um, uh, disclosures of uh, sensitive nature, protection, child protection, GBV disclosure, sometimes even sexual exploitation and abuse. And um, in order to ensure that the human rights of the people we are there to serve are uh, respected, we believe very strongly we need to prepare our enumerators to do uh, to know how to manage disclosures. That does not mean that we're turning our enumerators in protection case managers. No, we are actually um, very much saying what they should be doing and what they should not be doing. Um, mostly it handles uh, it, it, on um, what we call signposting. People might call it referrals, but what we try to do is to inform people about the available services and help them uh, get in touch with them if needed. But I'd like to hear if anybody else has a different way they interpret and then they can implement human rights based approach in practice. Dorian, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, well, you you don't like to, uh, and, and with, with, with the reason, let's not use the, the word referral, but at least to um, with uh, with enumerators, which are not so in, in majority of our data collection experience, we try to actually use protection officers. However, when enumerators are used, it is our best practice so far that has been shown is to at least to provide them with a minimum set of service mapping for that particular area, so they can they can uh, they can provide that information. So almost treating them as some sort of uh, something in between information sharing and outreach. But yes, of course, they should not dig deeper in any of the cases. Thank you. Thank you, Darian. And there are lots of resources available um, to help them. Anybody else with a different type of implementation of human rights based approach? If not, maybe Catherine, can I call upon you to give a different example? Sorry for putting you on the spot. No, yeah, I can. Uh, and maybe Francesco, you also here. But uh, in terms of how the what you call it, the categorization or the typology, we sometimes call it, for example, in protection monitoring. We are organizing our sort of framework for our protection monitoring by human rights and by that, you know, structuring that including the data collection, but also consequently or subsequently the analysis of it, um, but by uh, rights categories, so to speak. So human rights uh, categories, and, and that's a way of really um, emphasizing a human rights approach, based approach by organizing our data collection in this way. So that's for protection money, but, but I would also say, I mean, we have the GBC 15 protection risks, and that's again also a reflection of human rights and human rights violations we are looking at in that respect. So also for protection analysis bro more broadly. Yeah, so that would be another example. Thank you. Francesco, any addition? No, I was shy to say the same thing. Basically, <laughs> so thank you, Catherine. Meaning that also is uh, how do we categorize the things we ask for? So applying the human right principle approach in the way we start looking at the data we need, because uh, of course then when we understand needs, that is a subset of elements that we can understand from the protection analysis. But it's fundamental for us, complete considering the complexity of the crisis we have around the world, to actually have that lenses beforehand. So just uh, reinforcing that. And doing our due diligence as well in making sure that we are um, deploying and designing data collection tools and systems that are able to capture what we need to know in order to respond to the human rights of, of the people we're there to serve. Uh, Catherine, were you saying something? You're muted. 
Yeah, yeah, no, and another aspect of the human rights space approach as a principle of data responsibility is, of course, the very, I mean, fundamental element of how we conduct ourselves in the whole data uh, sort of exercise from design to collection to analysis to storage to use dissemination and so forth that we treat data subjects. I don't like that word so much, but I mean, affected people and it's their data that we treat them with respect and that we in the way in which we conduct our data work and the data exercises we are we are protecting fulfilling i mean respecting people's rights human rights so that's another sort of dimension you could say of uh, of a human rights approach can i ask a question to all of you who are the protection experts is the right to privacy a human right I'm asking that question not to be not to be silly, but uh, there is also something that we need to um, consider, and I think that's what also Catherine you were saying. There is certain um, there is respect that we need to consider when we collect data and we try to design we design our, our data collection exercises. We're going to have some examples later that might be maybe a little bit a little bit over over that line, and we are and and that we need to pay attention to. All right, Angeliki is leaving to another session. Ciao, Angeliki, take care. Where you can go back to the recording, hopefully. Okay, let's go now. We talked about safe, we're talking about ethical, effective data collection. Um, there are a couple of things I wanted to say about effective data collection. There's so much to say, and we can definitely follow up if some of you are interested uh, and, and talk about this more. I wanted to say two specific things when it comes to um, ensuring that our data collection exercise is effective. First of all, and we have learned, all of us have learned this the, the hard way, is that we, as Mahdi, Ahdi said before, Ahdi, sorry, said before, we never start from collecting, from designing questions in questionnaires. We start now, because we've learned the hard way, we start from identifying the decisions that we want to make about a response, you know, what is that I want to do? Can I do it with the data that I have? And if not, then I do a data collection exercise. Or I go out, even better, try to identify who already has that data that I don't have, because some people might have it. In any case, we start by identifying the purpose, the use, the decisions that we are trying to make, and it's essential that we make for a response, but we cannot currently make it because we don't have data. At that point, we decide, okay, is there anybody else who has that information? If so, great, I'm gonna use that data because if somebody else has that data, the data is going to be cheaper to, uh, to collect, to obtain, sorry, I don't have to go out and send people in the field, safer because I don't have to send people to dangerous situations and timely. And we could never stress the time, the importance of time in an emergency, right? So we want to have data as soon as possible to make the decisions we need to do. And if we already have existing data, we use that. For anything else, we call them information gaps. So what is that we need, but we don't have, then we need to look at um, the right method and source for that type of information. And only at that point, we design data collection tools, which are questionnaires, data analysis plans, and so on. So I'd like to highlight this as the first big message from me and from uh, the colleagues that have worked on this together with me. Um, we do need to walk backwards, not starting from questions. We start from decisions. We start from use. And then we go to information gaps, and then we go to methodologies. Only at that point, we write the questionnaires. I know, and I don't know if you are like me, I love writing questionnaires. So I would love to go to the, to the writing questionnaires, but it doesn't work. And what we have learned the hard way is that when we write questionnaires, we think that we need that data, most of the data remains unused because we didn't really need it. And also because we didn't really understand what we needed and we couldn't phrase the questions well. Also, there is a lot of data we actually did need and we did not collect because we skipped to writing the questionnaire rather than identifying what it really we needed for which specific defined purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. And the two people who put their hearts, thank you. 
it's a, it's a very interesting, it's a very it's simple, but, but really fundamental thing. All right, so let me give you an example with a question to you. If, for example, I need to, um, my decision is uh, how do I design a distribution or a service uh, in a camp so that this distribution or this service is inclusive of persons with disabilities and it's safe for persons with disabilities. So this is what I want to decide. I want to know how do I make, how do I design that service? How do I design that distribution? For that, what do you think is the information that is more useful? The barriers that persons with disabilities face in accessing basic goods and services in this context, or the number of persons with disabilities in the country? A or B? Florian says A. Alicia says A, thank you. 3A, perfect. And I agree with you, I think it's A. Meaning that, uh, of course, the number of persons with disability in a country might be an interesting, useful information but for another purpose. And if I don't have that purpose, if I don't have to make that decision, I will not collect that. I will collect the barriers to make this decision. Thank you very much for your answers. Um, all right, let's start with some more questions about methods and sources we need to use for different things. We have all spoken at length about sex, and age, and disability disaggregated data. I'm pretty sure everybody knows it. I use a very unfortunate acronym for that, but I'm used to it. So sorry about that. It's called SAD. Um, so if we want to collect set data, what do we, uh, what what type of method and source do we need to use? I'm going to give you options of different types of set data because. As you probably know very well, there is not one thing that is sex and age disaggregated data. There are many types of sex and age disaggregated data. Let me give you the first example. So if I need to estimate the needs and then plan or budget for a response. So I need to understand what is the need of the population. And I need that because I need to plan and budget for my response or the humanitarian community response. What type of sex and age disaggregated data do I need, you think? Give me your best shot. I'm sure you knew that because you're doing your HNO HRP. Okay, Dorian says an estimate. It is an emerge if it is an emergency response, thank you. Excellent. Anybody else has an idea? Percentage, okay, an estimate, a percentage, that's that's both possible. Perfect. Yes, so we have an estimated number or a percentage that it estimated of people in the area of the country or, or in the country, right? So we need to know an estimation of the population in need. Let's go a little bit further. If I want to implement a distribution of female hygiene items in a specific location, what type of population data, what type of sex and age and disability disaggregated data do I need? Is it enough that I get an estimation of people in an area or in a country? Or do I need something a bit more detailed? Yes, Alicia says more detailed. Cassandra says estimated of women in age of procreation. Okay, possible. Because they would be the ones needing hygiene items. Adolescents, girls and women. Perfect. Yeah. So, for example, if I do have to, if I'm an NGO that is trying to implement a, a, female, a, a distribution, I probably would need more than just an estimate. I would need maybe the as much as possible exact number and even the list of beneficiaries at that point, right? So it will be a much more detailed type of information that I need. Excellent. If I need to estimate the need and budget for a household why women? Why names? Because I probably need the um, the it's a, it's a it's a beneficiary list. So if I need to actually implement a distribution, I actually need to know the the, the 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 I might need to know the names. There are lots of different cases, and you're totally right to ask the question, Dorian, because that is what we need to do. Do we really need the name? And maybe we don't really need the name, and we don't collect that. Thank you. 
So other example, estimates need and budget for household level programs in a specific location. For example, for shelter programs, either building shelters or distributing shelter kits and things like that. What type of sex, age and disability disaggregated data do I need? Average family composition, brilliant. Family size, thanks, Cassandre. I also need the number of households, right? But definitely the average family composition or family size. Otherwise, I don't know how, how big the, the shelter should be. Excellent. Now, last one. If I want to plan a nutrition or an education response or plan protection programs for elderly people, what type of sex and age and disability disaggregated data do I need? So I want to actually plan for nutrition response programs or education programs or protection programs targeting elderly people specifically. Thank you. And that's exactly what I what I had in mind. So as you can see, for something like programming for specific sex, uh, brackets of population, age and, and sex brackets of population, you do need to have much more detailed data and also sex and age disaggregated data. So what the exercise is really about, and thank you for playing this with me, was to try and think through when we talk about sex and age disaggregated data, we mean many things. Depending on the purpose, on the defined purpose, on the use you have, then you will know which type of data you will need to ask your IMOs or other colleagues to or, or look for. So keep this in mind. Um, I'm going to skip. Um, no, I'm not going to skip this one because it's important. I have an example for you again that you will help me complete about the decisions and how this relates to information and questions. So let's do this. If I need to decide to make these decisions, you see, decide what advocacy messages I need to develop, decide how what to communicate as a priority risk to the HCT. So what are the priority risks that I want to communicate to the HCT in my country of work? Or and identify where I need to respond with what type of intervention, food protection, GBV, child protection, and so on. Which is really what you do when you do your PAL, protection analysis update, um, or any type of your protection analysis. What type of um, what type of information would you need? What type of information do you need that you can put in your analysis so that you can decide what advocacy messages you want to develop? Uh, what are the priority risks in the country or in the area? Or you want to identify where to respond with your intervention and with with type what type of programming? I feel that this wasn't very clear as I as I phrased it. So I'm going to give you okay, quantitative, qualitative, yes. What what information would you be looking for? Yes, thank you, Kimberly. So you have a number of type of information that you that you were looking for: most affected area and severity, most vulnerable communities. I gave examples of specific types of, of information, presence of explosive ordinance, use of negative coping mechanism, presence of factors, increasing GBV risk, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what type of method would you use? All good. All your answers are really good. Clearly, I've been working a lot on your POWs. What type, what methods and sources would you be using? Secondary data analysis first. Excellent, Kimberly. That's always the right answer, by the way. <laughs> uh, 
and as primary data collection methods? Okay. And I like that you, perfect, Kimberly is giving you secondary data, identifying gaps, and Dorian is continuing. Focus group discussion, key informant, observation tools, expert judgment, deep, you all know what deep is, protection monitoring tools, household two expenses, as Dorian, so he didn't include it, deep. Um, Dorian, can you write down in the chat what DEEP is? And it's it's a really useful tool for secondary data analysis. So I think people would really benefit. And if you have the link to the website, it would be very useful. Thank you very much for that. Now, in reality, you all right. Um, it depends on the methodology. It depends on the type of information and it depends on the methodology you're using. So, um, how do you know what infor what methodology to use for each information. You know what information you need from your path, from your protection risk, from the pillars, and you have these harmonization tools that Francesco will be sharing soon and has put the link in the, in the chat before that links already the type of question with the methodology that is appropriate or not appropriate for different types of information. So that's really uh, something that is going to help you. However, we'd like to use this remaining time to exercise and practice a little bit uh, how we do, how, how do we go about identifying the right methodology and tool and phrasing the right question, right? I'm going to skip this decision tree because you have already put in the chat exactly all the steps that we have there. Um, remember just to go out and look for data. And if you don't find that data, there is also the possibility of identifying other people that are already collecting data where you can actually try to include your information needs and so that you don't spend money and time. If not, then you have to do it yourself. And for some specific type of information, especially when it comes to sensitive issues, you would probably need to do things yourselves, yourself, but not for everything. So, any, uh, any reflections so far that you want to share? Because we went through, um, we went through what is data responsibility. We went through the harmonization tool that Francesco has shared with you. We went through uh, what does it mean to have to do a safe data collection. What does it mean to look at the ethical aspect of data collection, and how can uh, our data uh, our collection be more effective. So um, starting from information needs and decisions, define purpose, and only at the end go to the uh, the questionnaire, and also trying to identify the right method and source for each of the information that we need. Is there any comments, question, addition you want to do at this point before we move into the exercise? Francesco as well, you can also intervene if you want. I knew that. Yeah, I, I wanted to actually. Okay. Uh, no, it's more uh, expanding on the question because uh, we had during the conference very interesting conversation and then also all these past months. And um, I think that the general principle, at least on the cluster side, are clear to us, but there are barriers. So maybe just expanding down your question to the colleagues, what are the major barriers you see to implement this approach from your standpoint? That would be actually great to hear from colleagues that I know that many of you highlighted that. And Dorian has mentioned intersectoral cooperation at all times, not only during the intersectoral assessment. So I guess you mean also when it comes to analysis, Dorian? Yes, yes, and and uh, data sharing. Data sharing, absolutely. And and again, we've been talking about data collection a lot here. Uh, one thing I learned uh, from Catherine early on in my career was that we do need to think about data sharing before even we start collecting data, and that has an impact on the consent uh, the consent. <laughs> The consent that we ask people, because depending on what um, what type of consent we've asked, we can or cannot share certain data. Uh, and as Dorian is saying, um, 
because of the principle of coordination and collaboration, because we want to be able to use other people's data and we want other people to use our data so that not everybody goes and asks the same questions all over the over 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 and over again. We do need to think very early on uh, on data on how we do that data sharing. And sometimes we do need to go through lengthy processes of data sharing agreements. So it's better to start early um, before we we are too late. Because again, remember the timing issue is really, really important. We cannot wait a year to finish our data sharing agreements before we share uh, life-saving information. Thank you, Dorian. And uh, PIM needs to be streamlined among program protection staff to fully understand their role in creating data collection and analysis. Not sure it's widely known. That is that is true. Um, there are there is a lot of change in staff, and many maybe people don't necessarily know. I think you you or somebody else said in the beginning, training and capacity building, and maybe refreshing people's knowledge uh, about things like data responsibility, PIM, um, and not just the data or protection people, but also program and other stuff. Excellent. Now, yeah, I have an ignorant question on my side. What if an information need can serve multiple purpose and decision? How then do gets we it treat? gets priority in a DTM questionnaire. This is our instruction. <laughs> if, you, if you get the same request for the same information from multiple clusters, that gets priority because you're serving more people with the same effort. <laughs> No, but what do you mean with that question? What if if we have is I, it a, I tell you if we have if we have a need of doing a rapid um, rapid assessment, actually, you know, for a specific situation, uh, we could be confronting the option of including just the information need for that rapid assessment. So to design the specific response, but oftentimes we have just the capacity for that rapid assessment. So we could have information need, and we could use that opportunity to include information need that we need for other decisions that come in parallel to the rapid assessment. Because at the beginning, you have to decide the response, but then there is advocacy around it and there are other elements. Should we um, consider those questions in the rapid assessment or should we just make the rapid assessment strictly about the information need that we need for the immediate first decision, which is the response? I don't have an answer to that in general. Um, it's a balancing exercise. Um, it will depend on different things you want to consider. The time is one, the resources is the other one, meaning we do tend to have very lengthy questionnaires, which are inversely uh, uh, correlated to the quality of the data, but also we take a lot of people's time and people have a lot of things to do for you know, just to look after their own uh, families. So it really depends. Um, I think, you know, if if you if you if you are in the situation, you will have to use your judgment and go according to the principles to make the best decision you can. I see your hand, and I uh, who is who? Please go ahead, unmute yourself. I cannot. Uh, Kim, Kimberly. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Um, I just wanted to jump in maybe just for a reflection. I feel like Francesco also was talking about barriers and stuff. And um, I also agree that the first step would be to uh, talk about the analysis, like talk what is protection analysis, talk about data, talk about the importance of this, because sometimes when we do data collection, even if it's by starting by secondary data analysis, um, uh, we do need partners, like our partners are our allies in this uh, journey of data collection and analysis. So they need to first value the protection analysis itself and understand how it is done so they can actually engage with you. Um, not everyone is always uh, so prone to share their data. So I do think like we need also to talk about like how can be ethical, how you can trust others with this kind of information. So that's essential. And also, I do think that the type, um, uh, another barrier would be the analysis of the de secondary data. Like, for example, in our case, the path, um, like the time you take to analyze each document, and uh, this could be some barriers to actually like 
moving fast forward, the protection analysis, and like not always uh, you have the resources for the data to be completely analyzed. Like, I mean, like more people analyzing data will make it quicker. And on the other hand, also how much you can access the communities when you implement a questionnaire and like uh, one team cannot be doing a, a protection monitoring tool in all the country. I feel like also understanding which are the communities you need to tackle, which partners are there and join forces, like do all the coordination work and sometimes doing the coordination work can also be difficult. So yeah, that's on my end. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, and it's really important. Uh, one of the things you said really resonates with me as, as a former Ocha IMO. Uh, people would never share data unless they saw why it was important for them. So it's it's really important to to and to understand it first and then to be able to communicate it. Um, I wanted to, um, Patrick Rooney is, is writing something about a human rights based approach. Patrick, do you want to say something? Uh, hi everyone. Can you? Hi. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, just very briefly, I can bring you back to the discussion around the HRBA. There's three principles there for a HRBA that I put in the chat. On participation, uh, you mentioned something a minute ago about um, the relevance, the importance of the information, and why it's being collected from the perspective of the people that you're engaging. So. Of course, it's important to engage with them so they can participate in the process in terms of designing the process. Um, around accountability, uh, we could be thinking of accountability to affected populations there if there are any issues that the people have related to the process, possibly complaints mechanisms or some, right, some way to raise concerns they may have. Um, from a human rights perspective, it also has a meaning in terms of accountability for violations of rights and perhaps one area to think about is what we as people collecting the information do with it and assure that our use of it is appropriate and correct and so on that it's not misused not abused and then of course on non-discrimination uh, i think you've already a lot but we want to be sure that groups that are usually marginalized or discriminated in the society. And that we don't um, increase that discrimination by not hearing their voice, by using methods that are shutting them up in, in practice. So I think I think that's very important. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to move to the game the quiz, and this is a quiz to try to reflect together on which method and source are appropriate or not appropriate. It's a very timely exercise for the season we're living, uh, during which we see a lot of needs assessments, and sometimes we have a, a, a hint or a gut feeling that some questions are really not appropriate, but we might not be able to verbalize it. Uh, and explain why, uh, and maybe you know we 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 just don't say anything. So I think it's important to remember that we, as as you as protection colleagues, and even I as an IMO, we all have a responsibility to implement and to ensure the implementation of data responsibility in um, in our work and in our colleagues' work. So, um, where do we obtain the data for protection analysis? We have talked about this all all along the the, the session from many many sources. We, we have different um, secondary data that is available that are available, but we also have uh, specific methods and of data collection. We have key informant interviews, we have focus group discussions, we have household level interviews and so on and so forth. Um, we use them all. All the ones that are available and reliable and appropriate for that decision, we use. One concept that I'd like you to go home with, together with we never start with writing, questions, we always start with decisions first. The second thing is there is no one ring to rule them all. There is no one data collection uh, method that can give you all the information you need. 
unfortunately. We would like that to be different, but it's not. So we will have to use a number of different tools and methods to get the picture that we need. And each method will be able to provide us some information, but not all. So we have, uh, we're going to talk through this exercise for the rest half hour, the next half hour. And this is going to be an exercise uh, that looks at specific types of data collections. And I wanted to clarify what they mean, at least the main ones, before we start. Because I think it's super important that you as protection colleagues know what it really means when we talk about key informant interviews uh, or household level interviews or focus group discussions and so on. I know you know most of it, but I want you to make sure that you know everything that you need to know, or at least the basics. Um, so, for example, uh, I, I consult for DTM and DTM works a lot with key informant interviews. Um, what does it mean? It means that enumerators, data collectors that are not data, that are not protection experts, they're not WASH experts, they are not GBV experts, they're definitely not child protection experts. They go out in the field, they go to each community, and they collect data, asking a number of what they call key informants. These key informants are also not of a specific skill set or background. So they're not protection experts either. They're not doctors either. So they are a combination of professions and backgrounds, and we cannot always make sure that they have a specific sectoral um, expertise. So what do you need to remember here are two things. The lack of sectoral protection expertise of both enumerators and key informants, and the fact that you're asking a limited number of people. Usually these people are chosen because they have the knowledge of the community. Very, very difficult that these people are some of the most vulnerable in the community. So if you have a key informant interview methodology that has been used, which is great for many things, you cannot rely on key informants to give you the point of view of specific vulnerable groups or to give you an informed protection opinion about what's happening in the community. So this is really important because if you remember this, when you look at questionnaires, you're also able to identify a lot of the problems. Second type of methodology. Protection monitoring in South Sudan respondents are not experts, says Dorian, but are of specific typology. Enumerators are protection staff, thus somewhat experts. This is protection monitoring, and that's I'm, I'm glad that they are protection staff <laughs> doing protection monitoring because we don't want enumerators who are not protection staff to do protection monitoring. This needs to be very clear. It's it's a very dangerous thing to do. So for protection colleagues that do their co data collection and they use protection staff, absolutely, that it's a different type of thing. Um, but method is KIA. Okay, so they are asking key informant in the community. Good. So this is something, there, there are always little variations, right? So it's really important to identify, as Dorian has done, well, we use KII, but we don't use, uh, we don't use, uh, we, we use specific protection staff that do the questions, that ask the questions. So there are also variations that we want to, to keep in mind. So when you approach any type of methodology, ask these things. Who is asking the questions? What are their, what is their background? Who are they asking these questions to? How are these key informants selected? Second type of data collection exercise interviews with head of households or, inter or household level interviews. You hear a lot of this, especially now, because this is what we use um, with MSNA. Not only, but this is the typical MSNA uh, uh, data collection method. What do you need to remember about this methodology specifically? The questions are asked to one person in the household. Usually, we're talking usually, right? Usually, this person is the head of household. Usually, it's very difficult to ensure confidentiality, meaning that the question may be asked, very likely is asked, in front of other people. They might be the family, but they might also not be the family. They might be that this conversation, this interview takes place outside of the household, maybe you know just outside the shelter for various reasons. Um, 
I'm not going to get into that, but there is there are good reasons for that sometimes. So keep in mind lack of confidentiality and the fact that the person who answers is usually the head of household. And in any case, the answers are coming in front of other people. Thank you, Carmen. She already went to the really specific issue that means for GBV. What does it mean for GBV? That many risks cannot be talked about in front of the head of the household or by the head of the household. So these two, I just wanted to clarify, are done with uh, structured questionnaires, meaning that there is a questionnaire, there are an option for answers, the enumerators tick one or two or three, and then the data is processed as a quantitative data at the end and will provide charts and maps and things, and things like that. There is very little space for in-depth conversation in this type of methodologies. However, you have other types of methodologies that you regularly use. You have focus group discussions where you're not using questionnaires, you're using guiding questions, but you're having discussions with a group. And this group is selected in a specific way, usually it's selected to represent or to give you an, uh, a, an, uh, a group participants who are of a specific homogeneous group. They could be um, adolescents, they could be um, women, they could be teachers, they could be, they're, they're chosen specifically or you choose them specifically because they are, um, they are bringing the voice of certain groups. And this is what we, what, where you can do a lot more of in-depth conversation, understanding dynamics, and also understanding feelings, fears, and the perspective of specific groups. Other two, maybe not as widely used, but very important methods that you have at your disposals are interviews with sectoral experts or service providers, and debrief with your own protection staff. Um, the, you can go in depth in this type of interviews, uh, you usually would have uh, a framework, but you would not have a closed questionnaires, and you can get much more expert knowledge uh, from, from, from this. The debrief from field protection staff, if used well, can give you an incredible amount of qualitative information that are actionable, and they give you ideas about trends and about new things happening, and they are so crucial to understand what's really happening in a country or in an area. And of course, you, you as protection actors, GBV child protection, you have a, your case management data. Now, very carefully and very, very, um, uh, you know, with all the, all, the, all the necessary protection of data, you can analyze or you can have somebody analyze this data in a way that gives you information that you need um, without putting the case, the, the individuals or the case managers at risk. So it, always remembering that this is personal data and needs to be handled very, very carefully. So there is a lot of potential in this type of data that we not necessarily always think about when we talk about data and assessments and information. And this is data that, uh, you know, in the last, the second column is actually much cheaper for you to collect and analyze, to obtain and analyze, than it is to organize a household level interview uh, survey. So having given you this kind of over, uh, overview, I'm going now to ask you some questions. And if you know, we, we're learning while we're going, um, to tell me what you think. So let's say you need to know the number of IDPs in a community uh, or a country by sex and age. What method or source would you use? Of the ones that I uh, listed on the slide, but if you have other options, give me other options. If you needed to know the number of IDPs, would you go and look for uh, interview with head of households, with focus group discussions, non-specialized key informants, uh, interview with health service providers, GBV experts and service providers, or would you an analyze the administrative data from case management? Key informant interview, says Cassandre. Uh, Dorian, three and four. Health service provider, Dorian? Is that what you meant? Are you sure? Uh, yes, because uh, they they uh, would probably have some sort of a statistical information uh, on, uh, on the 
statistical disaggregations in, in a community. They probably would have and, statistical uh, disaggregation of their of the of the patients, right? Yes. So okay. it's a, it's like a, so I would use it as a control mechanism. Yeah. And it's a subset of the community. Anybody and else? Sooner or later, everybody goes there. <laughs> Two and three, focus group discussion and key informant interviews. Kimberly, why key informant interviews? I thought uh, maybe because of the type of information can, that they can give you relevant to the internally displaced people, like they would know more or less like a bit of information that might be of use. All right, thank you. Um, we usually use key informant interviews, especially because uh, compared to others, um, you know, it, because it's it's less um, less expensive than doing a census. In theory, you should do a census, but we don't have the money to do a census. The issue with key informant interviews is though that you can get some estimates of sex and age, but they're not very good. So what we try to do is. Uh, we use the key informant interviews to get the numbers per location, which are absolutely core data that you need to have in order to do anything. So each location, how many IDPs it has. We do get some estimates through key informant, but then we're trying more and more to use household level interviews uh, on a sample so that we can get a better breakdown of um, sex and age in, in that specific uh, community. So if done well, the two com the combinations of the two is really useful um, because you cannot do really a sample of households without having the general information about the population and you cannot be accurate about the sex and age only with the key informants. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to continue the, the questions because I don't want to be speaking anymore. I really want to hear from you. Um, so, my question for you is this, what happens if you use head of household interviews to identify the obstacles to accessing goods and services? So let's say you want to know about what type of barriers and obstacles to access of goods, distribution, services, and so on, a population has. If you ask that question within a head of household questionnaire, what type, uh, what, what do you think happens? What, what will you find out? What will you not find out? Right, Cassandra says, barriers for women and girls in the household might not be collected, yeah, but you can get something. There, there is there is definitely some of the barriers that can be collected. Any idea? All right. OK, Dorian can find out needs, but not sure about barriers. Barriers might also be misunderstood. That's very true. So we need to phrase that very clearly what we mean. Um, we need to consider for each barrier, for each service, for example, what kind of barriers we are interested in understanding. And some of them will be uh, obtainable through household level, some will not. Um, the important thing is that we remember that when we ask for barriers, we always need to link it to a specific good or service, because we tend to have questions in our questionnaires that say, what are the barriers to accessing goods and services? And I'm like, depends on the good and service, right? So it needs to be, in order to be usable, the data needs to be linked to a specific uh, type of service or a specific uh, barrier. And I was going to ask you this question. Exactly, but Cornelio has already answered. In, in a way, vulnerable groups barriers who are not head of household may be left out. So, perfect. Um, there is another reason why I wanted to ask this question. Can you use interviews with the head of households 
to identify barriers, awareness, or use of GBV services. So, no, says Dorian. <laughs> He's yelling it out. <laughs> no, says Cassandra. Why not? Cassandra, why not? Uh, I, I am answering with my voice because I cannot type so fast. Uh, I, <laughs> I said no because first I think uh, it's highly possible that the head of household does not know that maybe a member of the household has access or want to have access to any kind of GBV services, but they can also put, maybe they can su uh, suspect uh, specifically, maybe the head of the household may be a perpetrator of intimate violence, uh, intimate partner violence. And if we ask such question, maybe then the head of household can can think that the, that the person they are abusing uh, looked for um, assistance oh. and maybe they didn't. And then we risk we victimization. So no. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you, Cassandra. And I'm sure the others are also. Um, saying the same thing. And Dorian has answered my next question, which was going to be, what would you use instead? And he says, focus group discussion with targeted groups. And that's absolutely also my suggestion. You ask the, the you do that in a focus group discussion. And Sina's comment is definitely uh, good as well. So other question for you. If you need to know GBV prevalence data, what method would you use? GBV prevalence means the number of cases of GBV in a community. So, for example, how many people have experienced GBV in a location, a province, a country, a specific period of time? You want to know that. Which of the following methods would you use in order to get that information? Case management data says Carmen, okay. Oh, Dorian says none of them. Dorian, I why none all of them? them. Oh, all of them. I said okay. all of them. <laughs> Sorry. But, the, but, the, but the, with the variety, with, um, with a different weight associated to, uh, to the source. Yeah. Um, expert interviews and service providers says Kim. Secondary data says Cassandra. Okay. So we need to clarify what, what is prevalence data. Prevalence data is a percentage or a number of people, of, vic of survivors of GBV, uh, victims sometimes, um, in, in, a, in a specific area, in a specific time frame, right? So what we say is none of them because each one of them can give you very, very partial data. And as Dorian is hinting, you can put some of the data together to uh, maybe give an idea that there is an issue with GBV in that community, which is fine, but it's not prevalence data. So if we present data even from case management uh, or from police reports, and we present data on uh, people who have reported GBV or who have come to uh, enjoy the service uh, that is provided, we're giving a much lower number. So we are actually shooting ourselves in the foot. We're presenting something that is much lower as a prevalence data. So all the different methods that you can think about and that you were mentioning can be methods in which you understand some of the information that you need for GBV but the, you need to pre make sure that you don't present that as prevalence. You don't present that as the number or the estimate of people in a community who have experienced GBV, because then you're doing yourself a disfavor and you are presenting a much rosier picture than what it really is happening. However, and we know that we can we can program in, the GBV colleagues will, will teach us all that you can program and you should program according to the Interagency Standing Committee guidelines without knowing the number of people because that's there are other issues that you could that you take into account. So it's not an issue that is stopping us to respond from responding. It's just a, an issue of making sure that we present data as they are rather than mislabeling them as prevalence and then doing ourselves a disfavor. Can we use alternatives, GBV, alternative GBV data um, 
instead of the prevalence? Can we find other types of information that help us understand the GBV situation in a country or in an area? And what would they be? Dorian, go ahead. I mean, here we are now entering also a little bit in the zone, the difference between, you know, people at risk and people in need or that they have been victim or that they are also at risk of. So, yeah, you're right with the first one. I was thinking risk and at the, actually it was like a programming. We were talking about victims or survivors. And here we are talking about, OK, but those are that already experienced it, but we also need to do the mitigation. So I think the alternatives can be found in the in 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 various others, much more easier, accessible uh, data. Have there been attacks of civilians? We um, uh, we can talk about uh, the various types of information of distances from place to place, uh, women grouping or non grouping. Uh, so ma many many of these. Um, uh, easy to get information that based on experience, especially in protracted situations, lead to GBV or ha or are um, put people at risk of uh, uh, GBV. And for uh, for planning uh, and advocacy purposes, that is uh, it's lighter and probably more accurate. Perfect. And I would add only you can get information, as some of you said in the in the chat before, from the frontline workers, about the, the, the service providers about what they see, not in terms of numbers, but in terms of what is happening, the dynamics, the risk factors, as you mentioned, Dorian, and use those as proxy indicators as well in, in, in other ways. Excellent. So um, there are a few things that I recommend we use when we evaluate questions in a questionnaire. Um, we, of course, we do a do no harm analysis. Can this do harm? We also look at the ethical parts. Are we violating the principles and in which way? And explaining to the people that want to include these questions how this is doing harm and how this is violating some of the principles and what alternatives we can provide. But when it comes to effectiveness, there are four things I'd like to, to remember. It's not a complete list, of course, but it's it's helping us um, verbalize and uh, assess and verbalize why certain questions do not work and finding different solutions. So the first thing is, is it likely that respondents know the answer to that question? Some of you, and I think it was Carmen said, uh, or I can't remember, the if we ask the head of households, that person might really not be the one who knows about the service, right? Or it was Kimberly. So we need to make sure that whatever we ask in our method with our method of data collection and source is actually a person or a group of people that can give us the answer. They know the answer. The second thing to remember is whether or not this the answer can be impacted by biased. Uh, interest, agendas, roles, obligations, to the point, because at, we're all biased, but can it be impacted to the point of being inaccurate or misleading? Because if that's the case, we cannot use it. We have to do, we have to find a solution. Third thing, will the circumstances of the interview impact the answer? to the point that the results are going to be misleading or inaccurate. For example, will this person be honest telling me about this when he's sitting in front of the neighbors or in front of their husband? And then the last one, and it's really important, and you also mentioned it before, are the questions and the reply options, let's not forget the question is not a, a, a by itself sufficient. We also need to look at the reply options. Are they phrased in a way that my grandmother would understand? So is it is it possible for anybody who does not know anything about protection GBV answer that question, understands and answer the question? Are they simply phrased? Are they phrased in a clear way? Are we using jargon that people will never understand? Uh, are we talking about child-headed households? Are we talking about protection without specifying what we mean? Are we asking about protection services without giving an example of what a protection service is? If we're doing this, we need to rephrase 
and we need to change the question if, if need be, until we find that these questions are clearly phrased and they're easy to answer, they're, they're simple to understand. And the, the more you explain in the question, rather than having trainings, we do need the trainings for enumerators, but we need to have as much as possible the, the explanation clear in the question and no jargon used, the better quality of data you will have. So I'm going to stop here. Um, I will share with you the link to this presentation and you have many more questions that you can answer. Uh, but since we are very much out of time <laughs> at this point, I wanted to um, maybe just uh, ask you about your um, any kind of pending question or any kind of um, doubt or anything that you might uh, want to ask before we end. And I left this beautiful question on the screen because it's one of my favorite questions that I have seen used. And if you read it aloud in, in front of your computer, you will you will reflect on it and you will also shake your head like Francesco is doing. And absolutely no, don't ask this question ever. <laughs> OK, um, Patrick is actually um, pointing to some specific tools or some specific documents and mechanisms that you can use and you should use for your uh, secondary data review before you even uh, try to collect new, new information. Um, he's talking about national and international human rights mechanisms and um, giving you special rapporteur on violence against women, um, what is the CEDAW, uh, Patrick, convention? Help me out. Yeah, it's the Committee for the Elimination mm. of Discrimination Against Women. Against Women, which, which does work Thank on you. the convention. And yeah. uh, colleagues will find a lot of information there, specific country-specific information, be useful for programming as well. Thanks, Tony. Actually, Patrick, if you can stay on there, uh, I want to build on that because um, just for the colleagues, in the last six months, we've been actually working with Said and colleagues uh, because there is quite a well of source of information from human rights mechanisms and uh, in an effort to actually use them more in our secondary data analysis for protection analysis. So um, I will copy in the chat and uh, this matrix that we developed in the last uh, well, more than a year that basically links uh, the protection risk that we know, you know, that we analyze on, on the sample cluster with actually all the human rights elements and mechanisms. One of the goal of that exercise was two goals, actually, it was twofold. And please, Patrick, I mean, one is exactly on guiding on which mechanism can be sources of data, specifically when we analyze certain risk in terms of SDR, but also then when we do the analysis, how do we use that analysis to engage the human rights actions? So it's, uh, it's an, I think it's in some operation that's well explored, but we are, I think we are not exploring as much as we should the available data and information on human rights mechanisms. So that's just a message on my side. And Patrick, I don't know if you want to add something on that. It goes beyond GBV. That's the reason I wanted to make the point because it's an important one. Very definitely. Uh, thanks, Francesco. Very definitely it goes beyond GBV. Special Rapporteur on IDPs, for example, or Special Rapporteur on a specific country situation for the other treaty bodies. Um, but I would also add to think of these mechanisms not only in terms of providing information analysis, but also as opportunities to engage in, in protection action as well, especially mm -hmm. advocacy. Um, the special rapporteurs have the capacity to engage with governments on protection issues, for example. So there's many opportunities there with the human rights mechanisms, and of course the national human rights mechanisms as well, such as the national human rights institutions. They and their staff will really have a very good sense for the situation in the country. Thanks. Um, I wanted to also maybe highlight another source of data that is local organizations, especially when we work with specifically vulnerable groups. Um, uh, we, we I had a question before, how do you 
find out how many persons with diverse OGS or LGBTQI community there are, you never do. You don't try to ask people about their gender identity. It's like, so incredibly dangerous for people. Um, also, you don't probably need to know how many before you start uh, making your services inclusive, right? Um, but we do have uh, organizations working for or with uh, organ or persons with diverse sexual orientation, gender identity and expression and sex characteristics. And we do not take advantage of that uh, knowledge um, enough, uh, especially when it comes to local organizations. And this is an example. We have persons, uh, organizations of persons with disabilities that work at local level and so on and so forth. So do remember that you there, there are so much data out there and so much information that is uh, sometimes even less time consuming and resource intensive to collect. And it's going to give you much better uh, qualitative information that are actionable. Over. Thank you, Daria. Just to have the last word, uh, well, thank you very much for, for this thematic session. Uh, for us, it's quite fundamental because as a protection cluster, as we discuss and the global AUR, this year we want to actually face this upcoming HNO session that sometimes becomes a mushrooming of data collection and try to change a bit our approach, basically to apply this, the old elements of data responsibility already starting from this year. Um, as the last message, the harmonization we worked on incorporate those principles. So we started from that point in order from our side, in terms of uh, coordination teams, both from the protection class and they are with the partners to use basically the, those tools to actually have an operationalization of those principles. We will, of course, revise the organization at the end of the year after the application in the field, because, of course, we will it has to hit the ground to see to have you know, a solid tool or process in that sense. But uh, just to say that this session was specifically to help us out in understanding how to bring about those principles. And I really thank you, Catherine and Dania, for, for all of this. Pleasure. Um, we do have another thematic session. So if you are interested, we can, uh, we can meet again on the 30th and see how we can better work together. Uh, with the tools and methodologies that DTM uses so that we do not uh, use the methods uh, in order to collect, try and collect things we cannot collect with those methodologies and we exploit its, their full potential to for the information that you need. So see you next time and um, thanks, Catherine. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone, Taunia, Francesco. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.